Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Radio Free Cannabis, coming to you from high in the hills of Oakland, California, translated into 195 different languages, connected to a worldwide network of activist correspondents. We are the voice of the global cannabis freedom movement, and I am your host, Steve D'Angelo. Thanks for tuning in. Please keep sending us your comments, your rants, your questions. We value each and every one of them. If you haven't subscribed to the show yet, uh, please do. And remember that Radio Free Cannabis is now available on Social Club TV. That's online and in the SCTV app. And if you like what we're putting out, please let your friends and family know about us. And remember also to support the companies that support this show and our community, Liberty Clothing, The Homegrown Cannabis Company, and Oaksterdam University. Cannabis headlines this week continue to pick up steam. There's vastly more cannabis news than we have time to cover this episode, and the trend, thankfully, is towards the positive, with a lot of news out of the United States. But before we get to the good news, I need to share a couple of troubling stories. Both of them illustrate the power of cannabis stigma in very different ways. The first is the case of Gregory Longenecker, I suspect many of you listening today knew somebody like Greg. He was a short order cook, a Grateful Dead fan, and an amateur cannabis gardener. He was the kind of guy you would meet on Shakedown Street in the parking lot of a dead show. You know, the one who would shyly and modestly share some of his homegrown that just turned out to be some of the best weed you ever smoked. In 2018, Greg was tending a small plot of cannabis he had planted on state lands in Penn Township, Pennsylvania, when a Game Commission employee discovered him. After Greg ran away into the bushes, 15 state troopers were called in to pursue him. Unable to locate Greg or persuade him to reveal himself, the enraged and frustrated cops called in a nine-ton bulldozer to flatten the underbrush. In the process, Greg Longenecker, a gentle soul who never hurt anybody, whose greatest pleasure in life was attending a Grateful Dead show, who was not threatening anybody with any harm whatsoever, who was just trying to run away, just trying to hide, just trying to preserve his freedom, was crushed to death beneath the massive weight of the heavy equipment. The only reason we know of this tragedy is because Greg's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the Pennsylvania State Police and the Pennsylvania Game Commission, and as a result, forced those organizations to pay the family $475,000. The government was let off the hook with no admission of wrongdoing, but we all know who has Greg's blood on their hands. The really sick thing about this is that the cops who murdered Greg probably went home to their own families feeling just fine about it, feeling like they'd protected society from a dangerous criminal, feeling, at the least, like Greg had gotten what he deserved for breaking the law. Never thinking that the law never should have been passed in the first place. Never recognizing Greg's simple human right to grow this plant. That is the power of stigma and the reason we must bury it along with prohibition. We can't settle for anything less than an honored place for this plant in our societies. Our Second news item about stigma comes from California, where an Israeli cannabis breeding company, CanBreed, has launched a 3.5 acre farm. CanBreed claims to be the first cannabis company to license CRISPR gene editing technology, which potentially could be turned to some very useful ends. Sadly, the company's development priorities seem to be driven more by stigma than science. Their main objective seems to be the creation of completely THC-free cannabis genetics. The ostensible purpose of this development is to enable industrial hemp farmers to avoid hot crops, crops which have to be destroyed because they exceed the legal THC threshold for industrial hemp. But it seems CanBreed is late to the party. The THC limit caused real problems for farmers 
when it was set at a very low 0.3%, but it was recently raised to 1% in the United States and many other countries. Given that this raise is expected to almost completely resolve the issue of hot crops, and that in any case there is no scientific rationale for low THC hemp, Canbreed might want to reevaluate its plans and consider using the CRISPR technology for more scientifically useful purposes, like creating cannabis varietals optimized for specific medical conditions, or optimizing the sequestration of atmospheric carbon in industrial hemp crops. Those projects would be far more worthy of the can breed skill set than trying to eradicate THC. Moving on to better news, we've seen the legislatures of two more American states pass comprehensive legalization measures. This is part of a new trend that started with the state of Illinois in 2019. Prior to then, all state-level cannabis reform laws had been passed through voter initiatives. So this new trend is a big deal. We hear first from hemp farmer and cannabis author Doug Fine in a jubilant mood who will bring us up to speed on events in New Mexico. Thanks, Steve. And howdy from the Funky Butte Ranch in New Mexico. We just finished a game-changing legislative session here in the Land of Enchantment that included the passage of one of the best state cannabis legalization bills uh, yet seen in the United States. Um, it's a great day to be a New Mexican, and it's also a great day for humanity. Um, first off, the legislature was considering uh, many different bills, and it chose the best ones. Uh, props to our state representatives, Martinez and Romero, for sponsoring and the wide legislative support in both bodies uh, for this bill. Um, and huge thanks to our governor, uh, Michelle Lewin Grisham, and Lieutenant Governor Howie Morales, um, because uh, the right bill was uh, moved forward in our legislature. It passed our House, um, and it made it to the Senate floor before our 60-day session ran out. And here's almost the funnest part of all. Uh, our governor said, mm, no, we need to uh, legalize ganja. She reconvened the legislature with a special session, and the legislature got it done. It wound up being two bills that they passed in this two-day special session. Sorry to interrupt you, Doug, but this is a really big deal, and I want to highlight it. For most of the history of our movement, we've had to plead and persuade and coax and cajole elected officials just to get their support for even really basic cannabis reform measures. Now, today, we see the governor of New Mexico willing to stake her career on cannabis reform by endorsing the most progressive measure being considered, one that protects local producers, one that features strong social equity provisions, and then calling a special session of the legislature to ensure it's enacted into law. We just saw a similar event in the state of Virginia, where Governor Ralph Northrop called on the legislature to advance the timetable for legalization by one year. This newfound willingness of our elected officials to support our cause is a sign of even greater things to come and it's a testament to the dedication of multiple generations of cannabis activists who just refused to quit until we achieved victory. Doug, back to you to take us out. How's it feel? Here's uh, some of the elements that are so great uh, in this New Mexico uh, cannabis legalization um, suite of two bills. First and foremost, um, cannabis home cultivation, uh, is allowed six mature plants per person up to 12 per family and this is a human right uh, limiting it at all well maybe that won't happen in the future but cannabis home cultivation with no paperwork or registration that is a baseline starting component for any hemp uh, or cannabis cultivation uh, bill uh, legalization bill and it's so wonderful and important uh, that we got it done here in New Mexico. Uh, also, uh, we have automatic cannabis record expungement now uh, in New Mexico. Very important. Uh, from a basic perspective, it's one of humanity's longest utilized plants. 
uh, there's been this weird 80 years of prohibition of this plant. People who suffered during that time, uh, obviously their records uh, should be cleared. It's not a crime to utilize one of humanity's longest utilized and most useful plants. So that's a, a huge justice issue. It makes me very uh, proud to be a New Mexican. And on the commercial side, you know, uh, cannabis hemp is a big tent and uh, one wants to support um, all elements. Um, and uh, I'm particularly proud, though, uh, that our micro business provision that supports local in state businesses at up to 200 uh, mature plants uh, per entity that really gives a level playing field for in state businesses. Um, I know when I'm shopping, I, 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 for any kind of farm product, if I'm not producing it myself, um, that I am looking for something that's grown regionally, regeneratively, organically. You know, ideally at the farmer's market or at the local food co-op. And that's now going to be possible with cannabis hemp in New Mexico, thanks to our uh, terrific work by our hardworking legislature and terrific uh, governor and lieutenant governor. Great day uh, for New Mexico. The governor's expected to sign the bill this week, and it goes into effect in July. For Radio Free Cannabis, I'm Doug Fine. Thank you, Doug. What a tremendous victory in the land of enchantment. Congratulations, New Mexico. Moving on now to another longtime observer of the cannabis freedom movement, the tenacious and now triumphant Bill Weinberg will update us on the great leap forward in New York State. Bill, can you tell us what's going on there? Well, here in New York, we are um, definitely celebrating the passage of the MRTA, the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act which I would say is really the most progressive and permissive cannabis legalization law in the country. Signed by Governor Andrew Cuomo on March 31st, the day after it was passed by both houses of the state legislature. The most encouraging provision is the legalization of public use. Now, anywhere in New York state that you can legally smoke tobacco, you can legally smoke cannabis from Staten Island to the St. Lawrence River, and from Montauk Point to Niagara Falls, anywhere you can smoke a cigarette, you can smoke a joint in the state of New York. Also, very encouragingly, cannabis is actually descheduled under the MRTA. Most state laws conform to the Federal Controlled Substances Act of 1970, which irrationally places cannabis in the most restrictive category. Schedule One, along with truly dangerous drugs like heroin. The MRTA removes it from the schedule system altogether, regulating cannabis not as a controlled substance, but the same way the state regulates alcohol. The MRTA also has strong provisions for what's being called cannabis equity or restorative justice, ensuring that the communities which have been most impacted by cannabis prohibition and the war on drugs are the communities that are going to get the lion's share of the investment from the revenues to be raised from legal cannabis, and will also be the communities that will be first in line for the licenses for cultivation, production, processing, and retail sales of this new legal pro product. Now, it must be said that uh, Cuomo played a duplicitous and obstructionist game for years blocking and derailing cannabis legalization efforts in New York State. The MRTA has been introduced every year since 2013, and Cuomo only blinked and agreed to sign it this year because he is under fire and facing multiple scandals at the moment and badly needs the political capital. However, he was able to exact certain concessions in the law, and one of those is a potency tax, taxation on the basis of THC content, in addition to a flat sales tax. The THC tax or potency tax imposes a tax of 0 0.5 cents per one milligram of THC in herbaceous flour, 0 0.8 cents per milligram in concentrates, and 3 cents per milligram in edibles. Now, this sets a um, rather unfortunate precedent, which many activists are viewing as legitimizing a new 
reefer madness. And certainly, we will have to watch very closely as the process unfolds here in New York State to make sure that the equity provisions actually live up to the spirit of the law. Absolutely, we're going to have to keep a very, very close eye on that. Nonetheless, there is definitely a, uh, a sense of tremendous victory here in New York State. And here I should give a, um, a shout out to uh, some of the activists who have been fighting for, for this moment for a decade or longer. First and foremost, Vocal New York, that's Voices of Community Activists and Leaders. Empire State Normal, that is the state chapter of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. The New York State Chapter of the Drug Policy Alliance. And also, not to forget, the real grassroots, old school, OG activists from back in the day who were still in the struggle all these years. Like the people who organized New York City's annual Cannabis Parade which was launched long ago as the pot parade back in 1973 by yippie counterculture freaks and is still going strong. Hopefully they're going to revive it this year after it was suspended by the, uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. But the last one we had in 2019 actually headlined from the stage, one of the featured speakers were uh, among uh, the Big Apple's highest officials, including public advocate, Jamani Williams which was a, a sure sign that the legalization cause had hit the mainstream and that the long cannabis stigma was finally being overcome in New York politics. So it's been a long time coming, fellow New Yorkers, and we're entitled to take a bow and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, smoke a joint in a public place without any fear of the police. This has been Bill Weinberg, with the Global Ganja Report, online at globalganjareport.com. Back to you, Steve. From that gleam in your eye, Bill, I can tell you're eager to go out and test that provision about smoking in public, uh, or maybe you already have. While we're on this run of good news, I have some of my own to share. As those of you who follow my social media already know, I spent the past couple weeks in Mexico which is in the process of becoming the world's largest legal cannabis market. I'll be posting more videos and stories about the trip on social media, but wanted to share one of the most memorable experiences of my trip with the Radio Free Cannabis audience now. The video you're about to watch was recorded mostly at the farming community of La Pe in the state of Oaxaca in the country of Mexico. I hope you enjoyed the experience as much as I did. Hello friends. I just had one of the most incredible days of my life and I need to download you about it before it starts to fade. We visited the farming community of La Pe here in Oaxaca. It's a community with a revolutionary past. On the way into town we saw a hacienda of a wealthy landowner that had basically been torn apart brick by brick during the Mexican Revolution about a hundred years ago. Now this community is leading the way again, embracing legal cannabis. And we were there for their first ceremonial planting of legal cannabis, first for industrial purposes and then for medicinal purposes. And there were a lot of things that just touched my heart about this day. I, I probably had some of the best food that I've ever had in my life. Not probably, I did. But what was really incredible was the way that this community had come together first. Everybody in the community had a role from the oldest to the youngest, every person had something to do and was honored and respected. Everybody took pride in the work that they were doing as they were doing it. There was this one little boy, couldn't have been more than four or five years old, who was playing the snare drum in a band that was serenading us. I was really honored to be able to plant some of those first cannabis seeds and help water some of those first cannabis seeds. And we had this very moving encounter with a young man who's suffering from epilepsy, who our dear brother Danielle brought CBD oil to about a month ago. And the village just reported that there was this complete turnaround in, in the young man's health and they're really embracing cannabis as a hope for the future. Um, we had tortillas with hemp seeds blended into a beautiful, amazing way of blending traditional Oaxacan cuisine with, with new 
cannabis nutrition. You'll see more of, of this day. We'll be posting some videos. We'll be talking about it on Radio Free Cannabis. Um, but I just had to, had to report back here because it took 50 years of struggle to get to this day, to be able to tour around the Oaxacan countryside and see cannabis beginning to grow freely. And I'll tell you, after what I saw at La Paix and around that area today, every single second of those 50 years was worthwhile. I do it all over again in a heartbeat. Yes, these are incredible, exciting, inspiring times for our movement. Bill's right. We should take a bow. We should have pride in our victories. We should draw from them the strength we need to continue moving forward. But we can't forget that even with this string of victories, our enemies haven't forgotten us. They're still active, they're still engaged, and we must still meet them and defeat them. Legalization isn't the end of the struggle. The same prohibitionists who terrorized us and imprisoned us for decades are now using the process of regulation as a backdoor to continue their assault on our community. Their most recent tactic is to enact restrictions on the level of THC in legal cannabis products, either directly or, as in the case of New York State, indirectly by means of excessive taxation. Unfortunately, thus far they're winning. We've already seen the state of Georgia enact a 5% limit on medical cannabis, in addition to the egregious New York State THC tax that Bill described. So we need to do a better job. We'll turn now to our friend and cannabis scientist, Dr. Greg Gerdeman, to empower us with the real science on this issue. Over the last few years, a small but influential set of studies have argued that when cannabis is highly potent, it causes a more serious public health risk, such as a risk for psychosis. Now, a couple of these studies, which have come from the same lab group in London, drew an arbitrary line of 10%, saying that we'll consider everything potent as over 10% and under 10% is low potency, which was not correlated to psychosis and other risks they've looked at. These authors from London have reported evidence that patients presenting to the hospital with a first-time episode of psychosis were somewhat more likely to have been daily regular users of skunk cannabis than the subject population that they recruited from advertisements just in the community. And again, they drew an arbitrary line of 10%. And because of this, prohibition thinkers are able to say that science has justified this 10% line and that reefer madness gets real. Well, get this, none of these studies actually uh, actually measured the potency of cannabis being used at all. Researchers simply asked people about their cannabis use in surveys. And if someone answered skunk, which in England is used generally to refer to sensimilia cannabis, it was assumed by researchers, assumed to be over 10% THC. Now, that may be reasonable, but what was also assumed is if the subject said anything else, hash, resin, reefer, grass, nobody said reefer, but uh, imported flour, it was assumed that that was low potency and under 10%. And again, that wasn't correlated with psychosis episodes. There was zero chemistry analysis used in these studies that claimed to make conclusions about chemistry and which are being used and politicized to justify passing laws on the chemistry of cannabis. And that's important. I agree with you, Greg. The prohibitionists have been trotting out these dog and pony shows based on absolute garbage science for decades. And the news media has for the most part just amplified their outrageous and clearly unscientific claims. It's super important for us all to understand exactly how ridiculous these studies are and take every opportunity we can to educate the public on the real science about cannabis. Thanks for giving us the knowledge we need to do that job, brother. Following up on the UK connection to this story, 
We're very happy to welcome another brand new activist correspondent to Radio Free Cannabis. Please welcome our brother, Simpa Carter, with his debut report and overview on the state of the cannabis freedom movement in the United Kingdom. Thanks, Steve. Cannabis here in the UK has become a rather hot button and contentious issue over the past several months and few years. So-called medical cannabis was first legalized here back in November 2018. Since then, only around 4,000 prescriptions have been fulfilled. Of those in 2019, only approximately 6%, a very tiny proportion, were fulfilled by the British National Health Service. This has meant that the vast majority of the prescriptions have been fulfilled by private clinics. Although the prices have been dropping for the products and services that they provide since their inception and creation, they are still, in most cases, vastly overpriced when compared to cultivating your own at home or buying from the illegal or unregulated market. These clinics have managed to gain a stranglehold on the medical cannabis industry here in the UK due to the bureaucracy and red tape that is being created um, as we try to navigate the current drug laws and legislation to create space for so-called medical cannabis. What they have done to do this in the UK is that is they have created a new schedule to medical cannabis, which is defined as cannabis-based medicinal products designed for human consumption. So in order for products to meet this criteria, they have to jump through several loopholes. In order to do that, to be able to prescribe raw flour for vaporization, for example, in the UK, they have to be pharmaceutical grade flowers. Currently, other, th other than GW, there are no cultivation sites within the UK. GW are also restricted from selling their products within the UK. So therefore, we are having to be reliant upon importation from other regions and territories around the world who have already legalized. This is then giving them an unfair advantage and opportunity to conglomerate, conglomerate and team up to create uh, monopolies in the emerging market. There are various trade organizations and bodies here in the UK that are working to bring in large corporations from other companies rather than help to build up grassroots movements here in the UK. Our prescribing of so-called medical cannabis is not like medical marijuana in America. It's not dispensary based. It's not the same sort of system. There are much more loopholes that you have to jump through to be able to meet the criteria and to be able to qualify. Then the cost is a massive impediment. This has meant that the vast majority of people who could potentially benefit from the therapeutic um, potential of cannabis in dealing with their symptoms or their illness or ailment are having to rely on unregulated market. This has meant that they remain criminalized. So since the creation of the medical cannabis laws in 2018, we are seeing slightly more discretion in some regions of the UK. It is still very much a postcode lottery, but with the discretionary projects such as CanCard and MediCan Card, um, these are two projects which are plastic credit card size, little things that go into your wallet that if you are stopped or detained by the police for suspicion of being in possession uh, or for cultivation charges, that you can then use their legal counsel to help defend yourself in court if they then wish to push charges. The idea behind the CAN card is that the police are supposed to have been briefed on this, that if you have a CAN card, it means that you have passed their qualifying criteria, which means you meet the eligibility of a medical cannabis prescription. You simply cannot afford the several hundred of pounds a month um, to fulfill that requirement. The MedCan, um, the MedCan card as well is also looking to give discretion to cultivation and they're also looking to give protection for people who are then found to have uh, an arbitrarily high amount of THC in their system when they are caught uh, with driving offences. We're also seeing the Seed Our Future movement in the UK, which is a group of people who have come together to conglomerate all of the evidence and all of the documents around the start of the war on drugs, around the 1961 uh, UN Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, and how that created the Misuse of Drugs Act here in the UK. So what they are seeking to do is create a, get a judicial review and to get the highest court in the land to review all of the evidence provided and to challenge the basis of the charges. So they are doing this individually through helping people in defense of court. And what they are doing is asking the Crown Prosecution Service here in the UK to provide three things. Foundational evidence for the proof of cannabis as a Schedule One substance, foundational evidence to prove that it is a controlled substance, and foundational evidence to prove that the defendant um, has misused cannabis. We have already found from freedom of information requests here in the UK to the Crown Prosecution Service, to the Home Office and to all of the 43 constabularies that none of these institutions hold this evidence. So there is a strong movement towards trying to get the entirety of cannabis laws in, here in the UK removed. That being said, there isn't all that much of a social movement currently in the UK, partly uh, because of COVID stopping all of the usual protests, organizing and events that would usually be held by the various cannabis clubs and cannabis organizations here in the UK. 
This has meant that certain areas and sectors of the industry have been able to dominate ahead of others. As I said before about these trade bodies here in the UK, they are now seeking to create a stranglehold over the CBD industry here in the UK, which for quite a long time was in a little bit of a wild, uh, wild west in terms of regulations. The Food Safety Authority, the FSA, are due to take over regulation of CBD here in the UK in the next month or so. It is suspected that the uh, red tape that they're providing and the uh, loops of bureaucracy in needing um, an approved validation from them to trade means that hundreds, if not a thousand plus brands will potentially disappear from the market next month. We're also seeing um, attempts by the Justice Minister here in the UK, Kit Malthouse, to get a clarification on what is considered trace levels of THC in CBD products. Um, one of the trade bodies that we have mentioned before have, have now suggested and are pushing for a defined limit of 0.01, which will make it incredibly difficult for whole plant broad and broad spectrum products, uh, product producers to be able to provide their products and services to the market without them currently infringing the law and the legislation as it is interpreted. This means that a lot of the products that they were providing will unfortunately now come into the remit of medical cannabis, these CBMPs, these cannabis-based medicinal products, and I think will become far more restrictive and expensive to the average consumer here in the UK. Uh, Brexit as well has kicked on off this year. This has meant that uh, importation of seeds has become rather difficult because previously a lot of the cultivation of genetics has been taking place within mainland Europe. The UK was formerly part of the European Union. This meant that we didn't need phytosanitation certificates for our seeds. This has then made it quite difficult for a lot of the bulk wholesalers to import seeds from, um, from Europe to be able to repackage and sell them through their various seed banks. So there is quite, quite a lot going off in the UK as it stands currently, and there is a lot more to come, I am sure. We are, have our government are currently looking at the potential of a decriminalizing or legalizing cannabis for economic stimulation, but it would be under a very restrictive model and it would create an even more restrictive market, I would imagine. For Radio Free Cannabis, I've been Simba Carter. Thank you, Simba, for that comprehensive wrap-up on the situation in the UK, which unfortunately is thus far lagging behind most of the rest of the English-speaking world when it comes to cannabis freedom. But we know this won't last. We know that as COVID lifts, as the UK cannabis community is once again able to gather together, as the impact of the recent UN rescheduling spreads, as more patients receive cannabis one way or another and benefit from it, as the whole world begins to reckon with the lessons of the pandemic, and as the true science comes to light, the pace of reform in the UK and everywhere in the world is going to continue to accelerate. We're now going to turn to our dear friend and longtime activist, Dale Sky Jones, Chancellor of Osterdam University, and one of the most important pioneers of cannabis in California. Part of what we've learned in California is that how cannabis is made legal is just as important as whether or not it is made legal or when it is made legal. And Dale's going to educate us about one of the efforts underway to ensure that the new industry accurately reflects the values that the cannabis plant teaches us. Values like justice and fairness and redemption. Thank you, Steve. I'm Dale Sky Jones, reporting from the Bay Area, California, announcing that San Francisco has just launched a pilot grant program offering technical assistance for social equity participants. Now, the social equity program is designed to foster equitable access to participation in the cannabis industry, including ownership and employment opportunities that will build a strong career. How? by investing tax revenues in economic infrastructure for communities that have historically been disenfranchised, like providing grant money for startups, waiving inspection or licensing fees, and partnering with the Bar Association of San Francisco for legal assistance for everything from expungements of criminal records that bar folks from jobs, housing, and food assistance, to being able to enter the industry, start a business, avoid predatory contracts, and execute vendor agreements. The combination of financial aid, legal and expert consultations, and a quality education will help folks succeed in the cannabis industry. The root of the problem had to first be addressed by mitigating the terrible effects of drug enforcement policies that have disproportionately impacted communities of color. 
the equity program prioritizes individuals who have been arrested or convicted for a marijuana-related offense and for those who had a close family member incarcerated, like a parent, a sibling, or a child. Because a drug conviction can devastate an entire family and incarceration, it affects generations. Basically, we have been over-policing in black and brown communities, over-criminalizing over a plant, and now it is time to recognize the drug war as a failure and directly help the casualties, the families that have been targeted and traumatized. In San Francisco, which has had disastrous impacts, just like all cities across this nation, the effects of decades of discriminatory drug policies have been shouldered by the most vulnerable. Now, a few notes about this program itself in San Francisco. First, you may be surprised to learn how many people qualify right now for this program who no longer even live there. For example, if between 1971 to 2016, you, your parent, sibling, child, have been arrested for or convicted of the sale, possession, use, manufacturing, or cultivation of cannabis, even as a juvenile, or attended the schools in San Francisco Unified School District for a total of five years, or perhaps your household income, or where you lived in San Francisco, or if you lost housing, you may qualify for equity status. Yes, I said from 1971 to 2016, that is 45 years. So visit sf.gov to learn the steps to become a social equity applicant and get verified. After a competitive application and selection process, the city just selected the Success Centers, Make Green Go, Andrea Baker Consulting, Thurston Law Firm, and yes, Oaksterdam University, who have earned authorization from the city to provide licensing, business, and workforce development assistance to equity qualified individuals. Now, there are many cities and counties throughout California and now Illinois and Oregon who are also setting up similar programs. Now, each local government is defining social equity eligibility and providing assistance differently. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel wrote, In a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. This is the call of our day, and this is our opportunity not just to act, but enact social justice. And there's so much work to do. As we continue to push for legalization and decriminalization, we must eliminate the institutional and structural policies, the barriers for successful and generational wealth. We must deschedule to truly stop criminalizing people. But here is your hit of hope. We are succeeding. Reparations have already begun right here in the cannabis industry. With tax revenues fueling the social equity programs we have envisioned for so long, launching across the country. I'm Dale Sky Jones, coming to you out of Oaksterdam, reporting for Radio Free Cannabis. Back to you, Steve. Dale, thanks very much for that hit of hope and the reminder that even legalization doesn't mark the end of our struggle. In many ways, it's just the beginning. Because after the laws are changed, we have to continue to carry on. We have to use the freedom to build a world that lives by the values the plant has taught us. That's why this plant came into our hands. As we close out this episode of Radio Free Cannabis, it seems to me that our community, our beautiful international cannabis tribe, is making tremendous progress, even while the darkness still clings. Our love and our unity and our resilience, our gentle toughness, have carried us far. More in some places, less in other places, and sadly still with many setbacks and tragedies along the way. But almost everywhere, we are moving forward. There's very few places where we're moving backward, and they get fewer by the day. In spite of this, in spite of all the forward motion and reasons for hope, I know that some of you are still in difficult circumstances. You may be hiding your connection to cannabis, or you may be shunned by family and faith, or you may be losing your job or even your freedom. Know this, as long as you love cannabis, you will never be alone. There are hundreds of millions of us worldwide. Collectively, we're as large as the largest of nations, 
and we are potentially just as mighty. Committed to the common mission of healing our bodies, our souls, our societies, and our planet, we will not stop and we will not rest until we get all the way home, every single one of us. Until the next episode, be well and stay free.